So hello everyone, welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Samantha Shokin, manager of public programs, and I'm honored to welcome you to today's special program, remembering Bob and Yar 79 years later. On September 29th, 1941, on the eve of Yom Kippur, almost 34,000 Jewish citizens of Kiev, Ukraine, were forcibly rounded up and shot over two days at Bab and Yar, a ravine then on the outskirts of the city. More Jews were murdered in those two days than in any other single German massacre. Bab and Yar has since become a symbol of the Holocaust by bullets, shorthand for the mass shootings carried out in Eastern Europe that claimed the lives of over one third of the victims of the Holocaust. Today, our guest speakers, Alti and Beryl Rodal, will reflect on the 1941 events, the suppression of memory and attempts at commemoration, and the residents of Bob and Yar in the present. The program will be moderated by, MJ, by Museum of Jewish Heritage President and CEO, Jack Clear. Uh, Jack was born in Florence, Italy to Polish-Hungarian Holocaust survivors, Polish and Hungarian, sorry, before emigrating with his family to Brooklyn at three years old. Prior to his work at the museum, Jack had a long career in media, holding executive leadership posts at a wide variety of outlets, including GQ, Glamour, and Condé Nast. His accomplished career has been recognized with Lifetime Achievement Awards from the magazine Publishers of America and the Anti-Defamation League. Jack served for more than a decade on the Museum of Jewish Heritage's Board of Trustees before becoming president and CEO of the museum in 2019. Before I turn it over to Jack, who will introduce our guest speakers, I'd like to remind our audience that this program is being recorded and will be uploaded to the museum's YouTube channel in the coming days. I'll send out a link to that in my follow-up email. We will also leave time for Q&A at the conclusion of the program. To participate, please submit your questions into the chat. Thank you. And now please welcome MJH President and CEO, Jack Klieger. Well, thank you, Samantha. And thank you to our guests, Beryl and Alti Rodal. And Thank you to all of our viewing audience today to discuss this very important subject, very important date. So as Samantha said, we're discussing the 70, on the 79th anniversary of the events that took place at Babin Yar, and we're honored to have Alti and Beryl Rodal as our guests to talk with us about it. Let me do some introduction here. Alti Rodal is a historian and a writer. She has been a professor of Jewish history and an official and advisor to the government of Canada. Alti Rodal was born in Chernovitz in Ukraine, her early schooling in Israel and was educated at McGill University, Oxford University, and the Hebrew University. She served as Director of Historical Research with Canada's Commission of Inquiry on Nazi war criminals and is the author of the Rodal Report on Canadian and Allied Government Officials or Government Policies with regard to alleged war criminals as well as scholarly and other writing on aspects of modern Jewish history and culture. Ms. Rodal is a founder and the co-director of the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter Initiative. Barrow Rodal is Canadian and a former senior cabinet office official under Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Following government service, he worked as a merchant banker and a strategic consultant. He is a co-founder of the North American Forum which convenes US, Canadian, and Mexican political business and societal leaders to advance co con continental resilience. He's a founder and board director of the multinational Ukrainian Jewish Counter and chairs the International Advisory Board. He also served as vice chair of the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict in Washington. Bell Rodal holds degrees from McGill University and Oxford University. He was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Golden Jubilee Medal in 2002 and the Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2013. If they had knights in Canada, he would be referred to as Sir Beryl Rodal. But today I will just talk, call him Beryl and Alti. Welcome, Alti and Beryl Rodal. And uh, just to, as we start, let me tell you that uh, Samantha Shokin will share, will share screen images provided by Beryl and Alti Rodal throughout the questions. So Beryl, let's start with a question that is sort of broad based, but give us a definition and explanation of what is meant when we say the Holocaust by bullets. Well, many prefer 
not to use that phrase, uh, but it, it's a phrase that people use. It, you know, we think of, first of all, let me begin by thanking you, Jack, and the museum uh, for the privilege of addressing the audience and talking together about Babinyar uh, uh, on, as we approach the 80th anniversary year of those events. The, uh, you know, the museum now today has a, an exhibit on Auschwitz. And when people think Holocaust, they tend to think Auschwitz, the gates, the gates of Auschwitz, iconic for Shoah. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I can't speak with you now, I'm just on my Zoom calls. But in fact, about as many people died, retail if you want, as died in this Auschwitz-like processed way. When I say retail, I mean every victim saw his killer, every killer saw his victim. Uh, that was, and Babinyar is iconic of that process in which about half the victims of the Shoah died. They're much less widely known and uh, deserves to be much better known for a number of reasons which we'll discuss today. Very different from deportations, train schedules, uh, the selections and all the rest. Jews were murdered in or near the towns or villages where they lived, right there. Uh, its dimensions and traumatic impact were much greater on local witnesses and communities. Many more local people saw, observed, were affected or participated. Though that's a deep subject that needs to be much better understood with much more nuance than we are generally capable of. So while in occupied European countries, since the beginning of the war, the Nazis, the Germans ghetto, put Jews into ghettos to facilitate their gradual move to murder camps and their processes. In the Soviet territories, all of this killing was done by Einsatzgruppen, mobile killing squads uh, made up of very ordinary people. Uh, and who murdered over a million people, as I say, in the places where they lived locally, in actions that took place in broad daylight. The Einsatzgruppen were divided into A, B, C, and D, uh, Northern Europe, Central, and more southerly, a very southerly route. The one that we con concerned with mainly would be C, which made its way through Western Ukraine, which was where Jews lived. That was the heartland of world Jewry, in fact. Well, at the time, wasn't a lot of that, what is Western Ukraine, wasn't it also part of Poland at the time, before the war started? It, so that, I'm so glad you asked that. So that territory was part of Poland, a Poland being a newly re-established state following the World War I settlements. And the war started in a combined allied efforts by Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And uh, they together partitioned that part of Poland. Right. Uh, and uh, with Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union by Germany, that is when the great majority of the people we're talking about fell under the sway of the Einsatzgruppen, who followed the Wehrmacht in along these lines as the Wehrmacht moved forward and did their grisly work day by day, day by day for a couple of years. The Germans, this was before they established Auschwitz, Helmno, and the mass processing of murder. Yes, I think that's an important point, is that this was really the beginning stage. This was the, 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 the launch of the of the extermination that uh, that, that was the, the, the first great uh, the first great wave. So, Alti, uh, the mass murder of Jews was now happening at many sites across across Europe. What what is special? What is what is it about Bob and Yar that is was was what represented something so so? Well, several of the reasons have already been mentioned. Uh, first of all, it's in a major urban city, 
uh, it was formerly at the capital of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Um, one of the largest urban mass murder sites in all of Europe. And uh, this happened in two days. It's the first time in history that a metropolitan city in Europe lost virtually all the inhabitants then in the city to premeditated murder. Um, it's a symbol of the Holocaust by bullets. It's um, not the first major massacre though. Uh, just a month earlier in Kamienets Podilsk, which is on the Polish border, uh, another Einsatz group uh, commando uh, murdered 23,600 people. And uh, to those who know Ukraine, uh, there are a number of other cities as well, uh, which preceded Babinyar in major massacres. These include Zhitomir, 10,000 Jews, um, Vinitsia, um, 28,000 Jews, and I don't want to go on, but, and then there were more afterwards, major massacres in Odessa, uh, even greater uh, uh, number of victims in the graves there than in Babinyar, but over a longer stretch of time. And uh, then there's Dnipro and Kharkiv in the 10,000 mark of uh, a number of victims. Uh, so um, how did they manage to do this? Um, what we want to let you know is that the estimate of the number of mass graves now across Ukraine runs from about 1,160, which is Yad Vashem's figure, to 2,000, which uh, is based on another type of calculation as well. Yad Vashem limits it to, uh, if there are a group of mass graves in one area, it's called one mass grave. So um, they are, these mass graves are still in the places near where the people had lived, near where their neighbors uh, and the descendants of their neighbors today live. Um, uh, and uh, it was done, as Beryl said, in broad daylight, as Father Desbois said, uh, so that it was not a secret that it was happening. And there was requisitioning of the services of uh, the various uh, uh, local people. So that's, that's something unique in itself. Um, it's also, you know, when you think of how could the total number of all four Einsatzgruppen is about 3,000 people. So in Kiev, 1,500 came, not just uh, the Einsatz uh, commando that took the, its route there, but police units that came with the Germans. Even so, how could they manage to kill so many people in so short a time? Well, the answer is that they had a lot of assistance. And the primary assistance was from the Wehrmacht, the German army, various units of the German army. Uh, they lodged and transported and supplied the bullets to the Einsatzkommandos. Um, well, so it's a site that is not well known, the way Auschwitz is, is, is well known, but it's a central symbol of about a third of the Holocaust victims that, that we know about. And um, it's also a story of, well, first of all, it's the story of the capacity of humans for genocide. And that is an issue that, that makes me cry when I think about it, that it is the Jews were targeted primarily and another smaller group that was targeted primarily for racial reasons were the Roma, the gypsy people. Yet, there are other, uh, in every place, almost every mass grave has a number of non-Jewish victims as well. Mostly these were the, including Ukrainians who were, um, um, well, there were Soviet officials during the two years of the occupation uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, but there were also the uh, many other groups, which I will speak about later, but now let's to focus on your question. Um, it's a story of obfuscation, and that's why it should be made better known. First, in, uh, if you've heard of Operation 1005 
in August 43, the Germans decided after the Katyn massacre was made known that uh, they were going to try to erase any trace of their crimes. And they undertook this in a number of the major sites, including at Babinyar. So, so and, then, and then the post-war years, which I will speak about as well, when the Soviets very callously uh, suppressed the fact that it was Jews who were murdered. It was the Soviet peaceful citizens who died at the hands of the cruel fascists. So on those two days, September 29th and 30th, 41, um, what actually took place at Babin Yar? I mean, the number is astounding. The two, two days they could, they could kill that many. And that represented, as you were talking about, 34,000 was almost the entire Jewish population of Kiev? Uh, no, it was a, a, a small portion of it, actually. Okay. Uh, so we had, uh, in 1941, 930,000 uh, people in Kiev, right. about 160,000 registered as Jews. Right. Um, when the Red Army retreated and uh, arranged for a state-organized evacuation, most of the Jews left with them. Uh -huh. So However, the, it was the remaining Jews after it's the, the remaining Jews around 35,000 who stayed behind for a variety of reasons and people will ask about what these reasons are and it has significance for us to know uh, why some people would have stayed behind. Um, first of all, it was not feasible for everybody to get on the trains. So some tried but couldn't. Um, then there were those who didn't want to abandon frail and elderly relatives. Then uh, there were some people who were too attached to their belongings to leave them. And then there's the, the bigger, one of the biggest reasons is probably the disbelief of the alarmist media reports that this might happen. There were rumors. As I mentioned, there had been massacres in different places already and rumors spread, but people couldn't believe it. So even before the Germans occupied Kiev, uh, they came on September 19th, 1941. They already had plans, which crystallized when, once they were there and uh, they had a, a major meeting of the Nazi leadership to work out, coordinate these plans. Uh, unfortunately for the Jews and uh, very helpful to the Germans, was that the city administration at the time, after the Soviets left, was uh, controlled by the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. And they cooperated with the Germans until the beginning of 1942. Then there was a falling out, which has many explanations. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are, uh, it's, it's a, 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 what I would like Samantha to do is to provide a link to a narrative uh, which was produced for the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Museum in Kiev, which is a, a project now underway. Uh, it was uh, moderated by a Dutch historian, Karel Berghoff, and it had a fine group of historians working on the, what is the narrative of Babinyar. And uh, uh, there won't be time during this uh, short uh, webinar to give you much detail, uh, but if you want to know more, that is where it is written up concisely and precisely. So you had in addition to uh, the German, various German units that I spoke about, you had also the Ukrainian auxiliary police. And you also had militias, Ukrainian militias. Two of them arrived in Kiev. One arrived on September 19th, the other around the same time, a little bit afterwards, and they were there. We don't, there's no conclusive proof that they were at Babinyar shooting, but they were there. And there is a lot of documentation about what they were up to when they marched towards Babinyar. And that includes the murder of my family in the Chernivtsi region. So um, the name that I will give you because it's connected to the United States is Petro Vonovsky. He was the head of the 
organization of Ukrainian nationalists. These are radical, uh, very radical uh, Ukrainian nationalist group. Uh, they split, there was the Banderas, you know, the Banderisti, and the Melnik followers. In that region, it was the Melnik followers, and they created the Bukovinian Kurin. Petro Vernovsky organized that battalion. It's under his leadership that it marched through a number of places where major massacres took place, and where these, these people, according to the memoirs of their own veterans, uh, had set their foot at the time when the massacres occurred. Um, Petro Vonovsky um, made his way to the United States and he died there in 1996. In Chernivtsi that same year, or, uh, he died shortly after he had made a trip to Chernivtsi to be present for a memorial to honor the Bukovinian Koren. A lot more research is needed on this topic and it is being done. And we'll know a lot more in the coming years because a number of Ukrainian searcher researchers have taken an interest and they're looking at the documents. Jack, can I jump in for a moment? Sure, Barry. I just, I just want, uh, you know, it, it's a very complicated subject with a lot of detail. It should be remembered, it should be remembered that a good part of the Red Army was Ukrainian. So we shouldn't tar all, not that all team means to do this, of course not. We, so I'd like to speak about the other aspect as well. Yeah. Seven so times, let me just, so let me just quickly say that the gates of Auschwitz were broken. Auschwitz was liberated by a Jewish guy. His name was Anatoly Shapiro, who was commander of a Ukrainian unit in the Red Army. And that is the unit that first liberated Auschwitz. So, you you know, it's a, it's a, Many things need to be taken into account in th in thinking about groups. I'll, so I interrupted Alti. Let me let Alti continue. So just to give you some figures and com comparison to other countries, in every country, with almost no exception, about one percent of the population and certain groups who were the vanguard cooperated with the Nazis in the final solution. And in Lithuania, for example, it was mostly the Lithuanian militias who carried out the executions. At the same time, seven times as many Ukrainians as cooperated, collaborated with the Nazis uh, actually uh, were in the Red Army. And um, one does not tar a people for what a small segment does at a time of, uh, at an unusual time when this wind of violence blew across Europe and the, and the Jews were the main target. So Alti, just before we um, go into what the effects and aftermath were of Babin Yar, Babin Yar took place the end of September and in January of 42, the Germans had the Wannsee Conference, which created the official plan for the final solution. Was there any connection between those two? Is there any, anything that you can talk about that had, that one impacted the, the, the cause of the other? I would say definitely yes. It was a precursor that paved the way for the Wannsee Conference. Uh, Himmler, Hitler were able to see that large numbers of Jews can be killed and uh, it, life goes on and Germany can carry on. So, I mean, if they need more of a connection than that, um, I would say yes. Uh, that can be answered in much more detail to, to see what actually was said by whom and in what documents, um, but uh, there's no question about it. And uh, because in Western Europe, the method of killing Jews was putting them on trains and deporting them to death camps. And because in the East it was by bullets and execution near their homes, uh, you have a much more bloody uh, encounter uh, that leads uh, to um, the results that we have. And the, um, just to, uh, we should go back to Kiev because that's what we're speaking about. 
uh, 10 days before the two-day mass murder, you already had the advanced special command unit, the, the Sonderkommanda that was there. A few days later, uh, there, was, there were explosions and fires set off by <clears throat> uh, Soviet engineers who had retreated but had set up these mines. And uh, that was used uh, as a pretext for killing 400 Jews in one occasion, another 400, and then using it as a pretext for killing all Jews. Uh, and the, event, the events it themselves, from the, the Jewish perspective, from the killing perspective. Um, if you show a slide two, please, Sam. It was on a Friday, September 26th, an edict was posted on Kiev's streets, ordering all Jews living in and around the city to assemble at a particular intersection bringing their documents, valuables, and warm clothing. Anyone failing, the notice said, anyone failing to obey would be shot. And the intersection was not far from a railway station. At the same time, uh, rumors were spread that the Jews are being resettled. Some Jews who refused to leave their apartments were shot. Others decided that they will resettle and pack their belongings and wagons and horses. Uh, and um, this was the, the, the notice on a Friday said, Sunday morning, Monday. Uh, uh, Sunday there were, there were shootings within Kiev, but Monday morning, 8 a.m., they were to turn up at this intersection. The, Germans expected about five to 6,000 people. 30,000 turned up. Why did they turn up? It's some of the reasons that I gave you earlier for, for why they, they stayed. And, um, uh, and they still deluded themselves that uh, they were being resettled. There's another, uh, the next slide shows you a notification that uh, warns people uh, it's, it's the order, this is the order of the commandant of Kiev's Ukrainian police, instructing inhabitants on pain of death to hand over their neighbors, Jews and communists, in September, uh, and this is uh, uh, also uh, just before the, uh, the mass shootings. Oh. There is the, uh, you know, to, to try to imagine this, uh, please do look at the narrative for the Babinyara Museum. Uh, there's the three mile trudge to the ravine. There's a checkpoint where they have to leave all their heavy baggage and stuff. Then they're channeled uh, to, into a narrow funnel of soldiers and policemen and with dogs who flay them and, uh, and they have to keep moving on. They realize at this point where, what is happening. Uh, and um, and uh, of course they're forced to give up all their valuables and to disrobe and so on. So the massacre continues for two days, and the very day after, slide four. Soviet POWs, the next slide. Soviet prisoners of war, guarded by SS soldiers, are made to work to pile soil over the bodies of the murdered Jews. The ravine is about 45 feet deep, but 500 feet long. The peasant women here are watching what's happening. I guess they're curious to know what's happening. Um, then, uh, who is buried there? Older uh, estimates, until very recently, were that it was about 100,000 total number of victims, about 70,000 of whom were Jews. Now the number has been uh, made lower, the lower estimates are about 70,000 uh, total and 45,000 Jews. Over the and war. There were also, over the course of the war. Over the course of the war, the, the shootings continued until 1943 and beyond as well. So <clears throat> if I can just, um, so, so the, the, the massacre takes place over two, two days and the shootings continue, tremendous, tremendous death, uh, numbers of death, it's, it 
boggle, some continues to boggle the mind. But what was amazing was that afterwards, both the Germans, for obvious reasons, tried to cover up the crimes, but the Soviet policies were also burying memories about what very much so yes out the jewish identity of them so either al so or Errol can talk to that point if i could ask you to go ahead Alton. okay um so what you see here is the day after they're already covering it with soil and a short time afterwards uh, i think it's it was just about a month or so afterwards uh, they even had the self-confidence to invite journalists to, you, to Poland and Ukraine, and they brought them to Kiev. Um, in the, as I mentioned, in 1943, uh, this Operation 1005, it's called, uh, went about um, exhuming bodies from the mass graves and burning them. They tried to erase trace of the crimes uh, it did not quite work. Um, there were very few survivors at Babinyar. Um, one very well-known one is uh, Dina uh, Pronicheva, who was 30 years old at the time. Um, she was a puppeteer, somewhat of a theatrical person. Uh, she fell into the mass grave at Babinyar uh, before she was shot and stayed there feigning death and at night crawled out and she's the one who in, at a tribunal in 1946 uh, gave an account of what she had witnessed and then there were other witnesses who non-jewish witnesses who in their memoirs described what they saw um, the aftermath is indeed uh, one of obfuscation um, and and here we and, and here we have a very important point is that despite all the obfuscation and the commitment by nobody no government seemed very committed to doing uh, much recognition of it there were still attempts over the next 20 30 40 years to keep memory alive and to develop um, recognition of what had happened mainly by individuals and then there was an organization but um talk a little more about the the in the aftermath post-war how the 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 bobby r events were continued to be not only important and symbolic but the but but they were significant and and the actions taken to both cover up the crime but not allow it to be ignored uh, I'll ask uh, Sam to just move uh, forward for the next slides and I'll get to answer your question. Uh, sure. This is the Soviet Extraordinary Commission investigating the crimes of the fascists in 1944. And um, by that time, there is already a policy that, of the Soviet uh, authorities to um, submerge the story of what happened to the Jews to into a uh, more un universal story of uh, what happened to s peaceful Soviet citizens. And that is what you had on the bronze monument uh, that you will see shortly uh, until 1991. So if, uh, if, uh, about individuals, there are a number of outstanding individuals. Uh, it actually begins with a Ukrainian poet. Uh, his name was Nikola Bazan, who wrote a poem called Yar. Uh, in which he did not speak about the two days at Babinyar, but he spoke about the, the massacres of people at Babinyar. And at that time, the censorship would not have allowed him to, uh, to publish such a poem. Um, in the 1950s, uh, there, well, in, in 1945 still, the Soviets were going to put up a monument and turn the space into a park. Uh, but a few years later, uh, there was a secret decision of the Soviet city authorities to obliterate Babinyar to, uh, in order to allow for development of the city and, and didn't, they didn't want a, quote, Jewish site. In fact, uh, the ravine became a lake and uh, nearby brick factories 
uh, uh, pumped muddy water into it. And on a fateful day in March 1961, um, one of the dams collapsed and the landslide killed about 145 people. Some people say many more. Um, that was in 1961. And it's around that time also that uh, other individuals uh, begin to speak. And uh, the famous poem by Yevtushenko, in which he says, there is no monument at Babinyar. It's worth, it's worth reading that poem, but there isn't time. Uh, and uh, then in 1961, uh, that, I mean, that is uh, Yevtushenko's poem, and that inspired Shostakovich's 13th Symphony. Um, you have, in the 1960s, Ukrainian and Russian intellectuals, dissidents, who join Jewish activists, uh, especially at the 25th anniversary in 1966, and an outstanding individual is the Ukrainian poet Ivan Dzuba, who gave a speech at that commemoration, which was illegal at the time. All these are illegal uh, uh, commemorations. Uh, and in this speech, he, um, he pleads for an end to anti-Semitism, an end to hatred. It's a very emotional and uh, moving speech. And then there is the book that many people would know in the United States, which is Anatoly Kuznetsov's novel, Babin Yar, uh, which uh, was published in 1966 in a highly censored version and came out after he had defected in a um, fully edited version. So uh, we can go to image number 10. That was Duba, by the way. We should show Duba's face. Let's go back, Sam. Um, that this is Ivan Duba, the poet. And uh, he was awarded a, um, a special award, the Sheptitsky Award, uh, by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter in uh, 2016. Uh, so um, go on, please. Next slide. This is Kuznetsov's cover. Here are the, the unauthorized meet, uh, commemorations that took place in, uh, in the 1970s still. And many of these people are also uh, refuseniks and people who begin to uh, assume a Jewish identity. So Babinyar is also at the source of, a, an, an, of inspiring a Jewish identity among Soviet Jews when they came to this space. And it was a way of protesting. So, so um, even with all of those efforts in the 60s and 70s, what, what, what is there today in Babin Yar in terms of commemoration, in terms of recognition of the events that happened? Yeah. Shall I jump here because yeah, we're running ahead. out of time? Go ahead, Beryl. Is that okay? Uh, so just very, the story has much more detail and Nalti has uh, images of the memorials, but the story basically is Soviet power is reestablished in Ukraine. They are busy doing all kinds of engineering, including human engineering. So cities that were half Jewish, a third Jewish, 40% Jewish, are cities that are now 2% Jewish. Where it's, it, 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 so it's a story of massive re-engineering, including of That's memory. Wonderful. Thank you. Including of memory. Uh, so the original memorial took many years to build. It was very controversial. And it didn't mention Jews. So today, taking us right up to the present, we have a proposed museum. I'm truncating the conversation because you probably, Jack, Mr. Chairman, want to leave time for questions. Yes, so, okay, so, we have some so the today, a number of important businessmen in the region that are called oligarchs, who originate in mainly in Lviv, Michal Friedman, head of Alpha Bank, and a group of them who made their money in Moscow said, enough, there's been no proper monument anywhere to the victims at Babin Yar and of the mass shootings, which account for almost a third of all deaths of the Holocaust. Why shouldn't there be a museum? Why shouldn't there be a memorial? Why shouldn't there be a teaching site? So they've committed to building such a museum and teaching on the model of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. 
And uh, that is now underway. But people in Ukraine, a variety of people, are very upset by this because Ukraine has been attacked by Russia, so there's a war. And they feel that people who've made their money in Moscow must, in the end, do Putin's bidding, and Putin will use the, the stereotype image of Ukraine as anti-Semitic to play that Jewish card against Ukraine. So they're worried about that. They also think of Babinyar as so important that it should become the occasion for building national memory and that the state should be involved in building this national memory. Uh, so there are attacks on this proposal to build the Babinyar Historical Memorial Center. The historical narrative that Alti talked about is not a narrative of an existing museum. It is a narrative that would be the base of the project, which still has to be built. So people you would know, the audience would know, Anatan Sharansky is the chairman of the supervisory board. Uh, Joe Lieberman is on that supervisory board. Many Ukrainian notables are on that supervisory board. But for a number of Ukrainians, it's not Ukrainian enough. And they want it to be a project directed by the Ukrainian state. So it's a very live, complicated issue, which is not unlike the issue of memory across Eastern Europe. So, so in, in various places, there are memory wars. Yeah. Why should Jewish suffering be privileged? What about our suffering under communism? There is the debate about equalizing Soviet crimes with German crimes. So what is happening in Ukraine today, and it should be remembered, Ukrainians, in over 70% of the population of the electorate voted for a Jewish guy as president. So you can't call it an anti-Semitic country, far from it. But Ukraine is a modern state building a new identity. So it's not without birth pangs. Part of the birth pangs and pain is how to memorialize Babinyar and by whom. So that is a live debate today, which is a, a subject all on its own. But I, I, I do want to leave time to talk about one thing, Jack, with your permission. Go ahead. And that is the issue of mass graves. Yes. The, the significant to, uh, remaining right. issue from World War II that has not been dealt with. Not and been you dealt said, with. Beryl, if I get this straight, you, you said that, and you and Alti said that there's anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 Mass graves. It's not cemeteries. Those are places, pits in the ground where bodies, whether it's 20 bodies or three, four, five hundred bodies lie. Uh -huh. to, there is a, there's a phenomenon called black archaeology. I'm sorry to talk about it. It's disgusting. But people still dig into those graves looking for gold teeth and rings. But, but is, they're is, unprotected. They're not marked for the most yeah. part. Are they largely unmarked? They are very largely unmarked. So uh, one of the things Patrick Tebois, to his great credit, he didn't invent this, but he did a lot to publicize it, the issue of these mass graves. And he's identified very many of them, I think at least 1,200, so that when action becomes possible, he's not acting. He's identified the sites. He's interviewed people. But right. somebody needs to act so that people can come and say, Kaddish, the sites can be protected, they can be properly memorialized, and above all, protected. So it's the one remaining issue from World War II that has not been dealt with, not been properly treated. It's not been a priority for Jews. The priority for Jews with the end of the war was to rebuild life, support, build Israel, reestablish families. Then there was Soviet power, which made it impossible to do anything. But the Soviet Union went out of business in 1991. So what since? We're coming up to the 80th anniversary of Babinyar, and I'm suggesting that it should be a priority issue for Jews everywhere, that this remaining issue that has not been treated finally get action. And the first call has to be on Germany and the countries in which the mass graves are, but it has to be seen by those countries and by the German government as a priority for Jews. So that's, I would like to conclude this part with a call for consciousness raising and action on the part of Jews who care about decency, who care about our own bodies that lie on the ground and which remain unprotected, unmarked, unmourned. Well, that was 
very well put, Beryl. And, and um, Beryl Alti, I want to thank you both for your comments and your and, and your um, illumination of what went on then and what continues to go on and is needed today. Um, I will say that um, the museum itself is very committed to remembrance and education. And I will also say that this whole um, area of the Holocaust by bullets is something that we need to do more on both in our, in our um, uh, institution in terms of the historical documentation as well as in our educational efforts. Um, I'd now like to uh, uh, turn it over to uh, questions from our audience. Both of you were, were really very, not only informative, but um, I know for you both personally, this is a very impactful issue. So combination of, of not only emotion, but accurate and, and, and well-researched scholarship is a very unique and very valuable combination. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Samantha Shokin, who will uh, um, uh, give forth the questions that we have filtered through from our uh, audience. And I assume we have had quite a few, Samantha. Yes, we have many questions streaming in and very limited time. Um, so let's start with this question from Lewis. Uh, Lewis wants to know, he says 35,000 people had to be a significant proportion of the population of Kiev. What was the effect on the city of the sudden elimination of the Jewish population? And in addition, the property left by the the murdered, uh, which must have been a windfall for the locals. Um, the, at the start, the Germans warned the non-Jews in the city that they must not loot, take property from the Jews. Nonetheless, this happened. There are many articles written on this. It's uh, also summarized in this narrative that I mentioned, uh, which will be, I think, on the on the Museum of Jewish Heritage's website, so people can check it out. Um, it, 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 there, it was a major factor in, um, in how the, the population uh, uh, moved beyond what had happened to having a stake in uh, not, uh, and continuing to obfuscate, shall we put it that way. Thank you. Um, a few questions here related to the mass graves. Uh, Rebecca asks, should every mass grave site in Eastern Europe be marked with a memorial? I think that's a, an opinion question. And Joan also wants to know how one may get involved with helping get these mass graves identified and memorialized. Right. Shall well, I, I would... take a little, take, cut at that? I, I was remiss in not mentioning that it's not as if there hasn't been action at all. A number of private individuals have done things knowing where their family members lie, and so they've made efforts. But it's a small number, but it's significant. At the same time, the, the German NGO, the German body that is responsible for the Stellefeld in Berlin, the, uh, the Memorial Foundation for the Murdered Jews of Europe, not a simple phrase like Holocaust, they call it like it is, the Memorial Foundation for the Murdered Jews of Europe. They're responsible for the major memorial in the heart of Berlin. They're responsible for Wannsee and a number of other memorials. They undertook a project with the American Jewish Committee originally uh, to have pilot uh, projects to protect mass graves. Alti and I were privileged to be at virtually every one of these. There was phase one, there was phase two, a total of about 16, 18 sites. And uh, so they were very properly, even beautifully uh, protected in a way that is respectful of the halacha and it involved very much the local people. So the local people saw the projects to protect the mass graves where they live as their project and thank the Germans for helping them do what needed to be done for themselves and the others and the and, and memory of the people. So those projects exist. That's about 18. But there, there's very many, including Babinyar, which is also a non-marked, unprotected mass grave. So the question of where to go, 
Well, there isn't really a go-to place. So one of the things we need to do, I believe, in this 80th anniversary year is to create such a go-to place, first of all, for Jews, so that Jewish people who want to act will know where it is they can go to make their feelings known, to volunteer in some way. And one of the things Alti and I are thinking about in combination with major Jewish organizations whom we've raised this with from Malcolm Hanline to Ronald Lauder to Buzi Herzog in Israel and Natan Sharansky, things will be done, institu some kind of institution will be put in place to enable large scale action to take place. Uh, so that's a short answer to that. But should every grave be marked? Yes, but it's a project for generations. But you need to start. One needs to start in a serious way after 80 years. I would add something to that, and that is the importance of grassroots uh, action on the part of local people. In many places, it's the local people today who take care of these sites. Uh, and uh, in my own experience, uh, that is the case now, that uh, the site is protected, uh, not enough, because when I did this, I didn't know as much as I know now. Um, the, um, we should also not uh, underestimate the fact that since the mid-1990s, there have been uh, the variety of organizations have been researching the mass graves where databases exist, uh, but not much has been done to actually uh, go beyond a, a minor marker, certainly not protection. Yeah. That, is, that is something that um, has not been top of, certainly not a top priority. Alti was just talking about the site where her own family lies in Kisila Borivtsi, where the locals have very much taken a responsibility, uh, led, I must say, by Alti, but it has to be, as she says, uh, this is a terrible phrase to use, ground up, but it also has to be action which is seen by governments and others as being a Jewish priority. If it's not a priority for Jews, people are less inclined to act. And it's combined with uh, education, the, the sites that Beryl mentioned, the 18 sites, a lot of education went on in those places. Teachers were the lead in what was happening. They needed the, uh, the um, tools, uh, they need to, the, the awareness needs to be raised, but there's a lot of goodwill that can be tapped for this and it's therapeutic, not just for Jews, especially much more so for Ukrainians. And Belarusians. And their, their mass graves are all, all over where the Einsatzgruppen did their evil work. Samantha, do we have another question? We're running. Yes. Um, we have time for, I think, two more questions. Okay. So this one comes from Esther. Um, how did Yevtushenko come to write his favorite poem in which he said, at Babi Yar, there are no monuments? Were he and other poets who wrote about Babi Yar personally connected to the massacre? I can't answer that precisely, uh, but I would think that it was, uh, it was a, the sensitivity of a uh, sensitive human being who saw the extent to which uh, there was obfuscation, the extent to which there was callousness on the part of the regime. And it went together with callousness on other fronts as well. Uh, so it was something to, to galvanize, to, to react to, uh, in some cases, uh, they, there are very close relationships with uh, Jewish writers. Um, the Bazan that I mentioned, he was very close to Jewish writers from the 1920s on and uh, wanted to say more, but censorship wouldn't allow him then. And later on, he wrote additional uh, uh, poems and, and uh, other writings uh, showing that this, uh, this is something that touched him personally. I'm going to jump in here with, your, with somebody's permission, and even without permission, sorry. Uh, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, in partnership with the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine, has a prize called the Sheptitsky Medal. Andrei Sheptitsky was the Ukrainian Catholic Church he, he, for about 50 years. Extra, an extraordinary individual out of Lviv. A tzaddik, I think. Not a perfect tzaddik, but a tzaddik. 
and who saved Jews, sheltered them in his monasteries, none of which was turned over to the church, were all returned to the Jewish people. He sheltered people in his own palace. So we have a prize called the Shaptitsky Medal, uh, which is awarded to people who build proper solidarity and understanding between Jews and Ukrainians. One of the recipients of the Shaptitsky Medal was Juba. So I couldn't let talk about Juba and the Babinyar go by without mentioning that it, it's been recognized by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter and the Jewish Confederation of Ukraine. You're talking about the uh, Ivan Juba. Um, yes. yes, yeah. Right. He was the recipient at the 75th anniversary commemoration of Babinyar, which commemoration was sponsored the government of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, and the World Jewish Congress. So we partnered in that. Got it. Samantha, last question. Yes, and for, for a final question, um, are there lessons learned from the events at Babi Yar and current memorialization efforts there that can be applied to the fight against anti-Semitism? A nice question to close on. I'm not going there. <laughs> I'll do um, Comments on that question? Yeah, well, there, there are two, uh, two main thoughts that, that uh, resonate for me. Uh, one is that one must not hold collective responsibility, uh, uh, one must not allow collective responsibility to, to blur one's vision because it doesn't make any sense logically or morally. The generations of today in these countries do not have the responsibility for what their uh, or a small segment of their population did 80 years ago but they do have the responsibility to uh arrange, to, to to have an impact on how these how what happened is remembered and um i would uh, add here uh, the last slide if you'd like to show it please i'll pull it up this was at the time of the 2016 commemoration, the 75th anniversary. And at the entrance to Babinyar at the time was this sign and it says, Babinyar is the place of mass executions of people of various nationalities, religions, political beliefs. The peak of the cruelty, our pain, our memory, one of the most horrible pages in the chronicle of evil and suffering, written with human blood. Is there something missing in this sign? Nothing mentioned about Jews. There are no, there are no Jews here. It's universalized right. and, and in this sense minimized. Uh, one should, of course, mention the many non-Jews who were victims as well, and they are in various proportions. There are thousands of prisoners of war who died and, and their bodies were thrown in, in the yard as well. And uh, the gypsies were targeted for the same reason res on racial grounds, but there were 128, not that the, ma the number should matter, but the two days and the Jews, 34,000, that deserves, the, the, the word Jew should be part of what any sign at Babin Yar should say. And well, this continues, um, unfortunately, to this day. Uh, just to add a word, Final word course, it's ahead. not the number. It's just that the nature of the targeting. Every Jew was targeted for extinction. Every Jew was targeted for extinction. That was not true of anyone else. Um, I think we're, uh, we're, we're not able to handle any more questions. Unfortunately, I wish we had a lot more time because I know we have a lot more questions. But let me... Let me uh, close by thanking you, Alpi, and thanking you, Beryl, for a, for a fascinating hour. I mean, I can't believe an hour went so quickly, but the subject is of such greater depth, you feel like we should have more time, and, and maybe we can set some more time down the road. Um, but I want to thank you on behalf of the museum, on behalf of the, its um, audience, and um, thank you for the work you've done and for sharing this information. And I will tell you in closing that the museum will continue to do more on the subject of the Holocaust by bullets, the specific uh, stories of uh, um, mass killing and, and, and uh, mass uh, graves. 
and this has been a very valuable and important session. So thank you both very much for your contribution. And thank you, Jack. And let us wish everyone, you and all the audience, a healthy, safe new year. Thank you. Thank you, um, both of you. And, 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 and same to you, a healthy, safe, and, and, and sweet uh, next year. Um, Samantha, I'm going to give it back to you to close up the, uh, the, the, the session. Thank you so much, Alti Beryl. I want to echo what Jack said. Uh, we so appreciate you taking the time to uh, present this fascinating, fascinating uh, program. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, the program was recorded. I'll send a link to that recording in my follow-up email, which will go out tomorrow. Uh, if anyone has any questions that they would like to direct to Alti or Beryl, uh, I'll provide my email address as well. You can send them to me and I'll pass them along. So thank you once again.